At this, at this time, I would like to introduce our next keynote speaker, Commanding General of the 75th Innovation Command, Major General Rich Stats. Please help me welcome Major General Rich Stats. All right, good morning, good morning. First of all, thank you for being here. I know on a Wednesday afternoon at AUSA, the last place in the world that we usually find people are, is here out in the audience. Uh, usually by this time, people are either heading back to National Airport or if you're from the Pentagon, you're hiding in a coffee shop somewhere here. So thanks for being here with us today. We're only gonna spend about 25 minutes together. I'm gonna leave lots and lots of time for Q&A. We have actually only got six charts. But the real heroes in my organization are sitting in the back there. We got uh, Ron Corsetti and Steve Hart. We got my Deputy Commanding General, Rob Guidry. And those are the people who really make things happen. So if you got a hard question, I'm gonna put it back to them. Um, so go ahead, next chart. We're gonna talk about structure and soldiers in following charts. But one of the key things I wanna talk about is what is innovation? What is innovation? So innovation is a combination of creativity as well as production. How many of you folks have been involved in music over the years? Anybody? Anybody? Who knows what music is? Okay, all right, a few of you. So I do a lot of work with musicians, and I find some of them are wildly, wildly creative, but not so productive. So what we're trying to do is harness people's creativity and make sure they produce things. How many folks were at the uh, luncheon where General McConville spoke? Yesterday, the Eisenhower luncheon? What, when he says, when he looks at General Murray, who we're direct support to, he says, I'm gonna measure you on one thing, and that's what have you put in the hands of soldiers? So not just creativity, but it's gotta be productivity. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Every organization in the military has one of these charts with their vision and mission statement, et cetera. The thing I wanna point out, and it's in this chart, and it's going to be a point I make throughout the briefing is, we're all about bridging. We're all about bridging. We've got these soldiers, civilian, they're, they're, they have their civilian skills, education, certifications, and experience, but also they understand tactics and strategy and doctrine. And they're bridging the worlds of technology, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, with the Army. And it's a big part of what we do. Next chart, please. So we talked a little bit about bridging on that, the, uh, the previous chart, but the thing I want to point out on this one is, if you look on the far right-hand side, talks about innovate, innovators immediately. My, my soldiers do not have to get spun up. A lot of them are on the ground working right now. In fact, uh, Ron and Steve over there, they both uh, on full time have been doing things full time. I've got some other folks, Heather White, Carl Nell. I've got a bunch of people who are working in army organizations right now making a difference. And speaking of my soldiers, next chart. So that's probably a little bit of an eye chart, but what I would tell you is all of these soldiers are absolutely amazing in their civilian careers. We've got CEOs, we've got COOs, CFOs, we've got lead scientists and engineers, we've got folks with seminal patents, we've got the actual leader for the undersea lab for the Navy who's in my formation now. And they're just an amazing, amazing group of people. Go ahead, next chart. I told you we'd have time for Q&A. You thought I was fibbing to you, didn't you? So how we're arrayed, right now we're in our initial capability. We just started on the 1st of April. We're at about 287 soldiers as of today. When we get to full operational capability, sometime in the next 24 months, we're gonna be distributed across 23 cities in the United States, working with innovators in academia, in industry, and other parts of the government. One of the things that we find is that there's a lot of research and development going on in the government and other parts of the government are not aware of it. So there may have been a, a problem that was solved at one of the national labs that's very, very important to one of the PEOs or program managers somewhere else and they're just unaware of that. So that's, that's part of our mission. So those are my scouts out. Those are the people that are gonna be part of those ecosystems. And by the way, they're probably part of it today in their civilian job. They're a professor at a university somewhere they're an engineer in a major corporation. They're a director at a lab. So they're out there, they're trusted, they understand that world. Then the other side of it's gonna be my chief innovation officer and his staff in those portfolios, those are gonna be resident with me in Houston. And their job's gonna to be to take the input from the folks out in the field, 
identify how it matches up with the technology gaps that have been identified by some of the earlier speakers here, Army Application Lab, Army Research Lab, CCDC, and they're going to help them fill some of those existing R&D gaps. Next chart, please. Okay, so how many folks have heard me use the word bridging yet? If you're playing Stotts Bingo, you know, they'd only they'd be one card with 25 uh, bridges on it. So key thing, how are we going to measure success? And it goes back to exactly what the Chief of Staff of the Army said. It's going to be products in the hands of soldiers out in those field armies. That's how he's measuring General Murray's success, and that's how we're measuring our success in turn. One of the questions I get when I go out and I talk to our traditional industry partners is that sometimes people think that we're putting too much emphasis on the small innovators, the folks in the garage, and that type of thing. There may be great ideas out there in academia. There may be great ideas out there with our small innovators and our startups. But to get it across the enterprise, to put those products in the hand of 1.2 million soldiers out there, we're going to need the experience and the capabilities in our industrial base. So who's part of that innovative community? It's not just the small startups. It's not just academia. It's not R&D centers. It's everybody across that uh, future force modernization enterprise. Next chart. Okay, these are our uh, 20, 2020 lines of effort. A couple things to point out here on the chart. So the first thing is we've got two bosses. How many of you folks have a, a civilian job and a spouse? Then you know what it's like to have two bosses, right? I have beloved Ann. She's household six. She's my big boss, but I also work for General Lucky from the USAR standpoint. That's where we're assigned to, and we're direct support to General Murray and Army Futures Command. So unless I get a mission in the Army side, it's a mission only from General Lucky and General Murray. I, just, I don't want you to be fooled into believing that beloved Ann tells me to, what to do on the military side. So, so Steve, Ron, Rob, we're not getting direct from beloved Ann for our missions. But we've got three areas that we're going to focus on this year in particular. What's the Chief of Staff of the Army's top priority? People, right? People. How many folks went to the, uh, went to the talent management? Who, who popped into that? You popped into it, but Chief of Staff of the Army as well, right? I wasn't pointing you out. I'm sorry. It was, I was thinking of General McConville. And he did that because it's such an important area. One of the things that I got a direct tasking from General McConville when he first came on board was he said, listen, we've got all these civilian education skills, experience, and certifications. How many folks have ever heard him tell the story about the staff sergeant when he was in Afghanistan who was the city planner for Houston, helped him design all the bases? And he says, there's so many times when I've been overseas in the last 18 years when I couldn't have done my mission if I had had those skills in Compo 2 and Compo 3 that we were able to draw in. So that's actually our top priority. That's our priority effort, developing this civilian education skills experience certification. We call it the CSEC for short database. So that the next time one of the COCOMs or one of the uh, ASCCs says, hey, we need people with this kind of a background. I need a tap dancing brain surgeon with a PhD in ballet, will reach right out and say, oh, that's Ron Corsetti, you know, or, or whoever it ends up being. I'm picking on Ron because I can. Okay. The next one down is we're looking at tech scouting. Now, what is, what is tech scouting? Tech scouting is with that identified prioritized list of technology gaps, our folks will go out and work in academia and industry, other parts of the government, and find technologies that can help bridge some of those gaps. What are we going to do with them? We give them to our partners. And who are our partners? Our partners are Army Research Lab, CCDC, and all the subordinate commands of that, as well as the Army Applications Lab that's right there in AFC. And then finally, we've got a bunch of existing taskings that we've been given by General Murray and by General Lucky. And examples would be, we talked about Ron and Steve already, we got asked recently by the G6 of the Army, he said, hey, I need some data scientists. I need some people who are big data experts. And so we're in the process right now of reaching out across the USAR. About one half of 1% of the United States has a PhD. We're blessed in my command. We've got 7% of our soldiers have PhDs in this command. So it's, a, it's just an amazing group of men and women. 
Next chart. All right, so a couple things on the Q&A piece, and I told you I wanted to leave lots and lots of time for that. First of all, we're trying to create a sustainable future, right? So rather than hand you out lots and lots of things which will invariably end up either holding up your sandwich or on the floor or out in the hall somewhere, what we've done is we've produced a, a website with all our material on it. So if you've got something on your iDevice or your Android, you can just scan the QR code. It's got some videos. Um, it even, might even have something to do with a cat and Steve Hart. I don't know. I mean, that, we'll leave that as for your imagination. For the Q&A part, I'll take whatever questions you have. But also, going back to Steve and Ron, using an extremely whatever personal, unscientific, and biased method they choose, they're going to pick the questioner who asked the best question, and there is a prize for you, a surprise prize that you'll get. So who's got my first question? This prize will be easy. Okay, go ahead. So you talked about. So I talked about the relationship uh, between, between small, small business, province, government, and academia. Can you go through for me the, um, the systems that you've got in place to make sure that they're. So um, the question was, I talked about small business and I talked about large industry and I talked about academia and the question was, what does that flow chart look like? We're, we're plugged into a system. So we ourselves, we, I don't have any money, either from the Army side or Beloved Ann, either one. So I got no money at all. I get, it, I get enough for lunch and that's about it. But what we do is we put it into the existing system where that money is. So Army Applications Lab is really mostly A to 4, other transactional authorities, that's what they're working on, prototyping. If we want to go back into a traditional program to the PEOs and PMs, we'd run that through the CCDC side of the house. If we're talking about basic kinds of research things, we give that to Phil Picante and his group over in Army Research Lab. So really, we're, we're not, at my level, tied directly into the acquisition system. We're, we're acting as that bridging organization. That said, I've got soldiers who are supporting those organizations as well. So we've got people at the Army, um, at the Army Research Lab, we've got folks at CCDC. We have people that are working up at the ASALT in, the, as in their soldier role. We would make them aware of it and then it's it's going to be up to that. But when and I would tell you this: uh, we have anybody here from Lockmart or Boeing or any of the large primes. So when I, when I go talk to them and I do on a frequent basis, they always bring that up. They said we're here. Let us know what kind of capabilities are out there. We're eager to to partner with them. W but we don't have any legislative mandate or authority to do that. We what we can do is provide information. Good question, sir. Data Analysis Center. So, all right. So, you're one of my that, partners. For the fact that I'm We're asking give this a question. Hug at the end of this. So, so the quick turn analysis. So, is it all internal, or are you partnering with? No, no, no. We're, like par BAC we're partnering with them. So, okay. if you want us to provide, for example, subject matter experts in a particular area, or data scientists, or something, you know, grab us and we'll. Or if you're asking questions about General Murray, you may not have. So Guy Walsh from uh, University of Texas in San Antonio. How, how do you, um, there are many of uh, the reserve component uh, that are engaged in academia. What is the overall strategy that you're using for uh, engagement with, uh, with the academic portion of this, uh, particularly for the foundational research, the 6-1 through 6-3 type research? Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a great question. Everybody heard the question, how are we integrating with academia? We're, we're really doing it kind of through four methods. First is through contact, through conferences, through meeting with you, through announcements. 
There's a number of programs, for example, DIU runs this Hacking for Defense program, um, and we've done some of that. We also have soldiers who have PhDs who can do things like sit on uh, thesis dissertation committees, be a reader on a committee. We can co-publish articles with you. We can share information from other universities and colleges. Now, the one thing I want to be cautious about is there was a question that General Murray and uh, Dr. Jetty got asked earlier about intellectual property. So one of my main concerns is how do we interface with people who are doing great fundamental research and share it in a way that it can be synergistic but not in a way where they steal your intellectual property. And we're bringing a group of lawyers on uh, later this year. We're supposed to get a, a, a small squad of lawyers together to talk about intellectual property. The good news is that Dr. Jetty, the ASALT, he's from the small business world. And that he actually put out a policy about how we're going to do that in broad sweeps. It's a relatively small document, but he lays out his guidance with that. So that would be the one caution. And we're still, I would be honest, we're still feeling our way through that. Does that help? Absolutely. OK. Who's got, another, who's got another awesome question for me? How are we doing time-wise, whoever's keeping time? I'm good. OK. We're way ahead of schedule and under budget. Hey, hey sir. Uh General Norris here. Um, on the creativity and production, is it too early to give us a concrete example of something you've produced yet, or are you still in the in the in the phase of? Um, I'm going to turn right to Ron and Steve. Can you give two or three examples of some things that we've produced? I, so the answer is we've actually produced a bunch of things already. So go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the wins that we had recently, we have a group out in Silicon Valley, and they interact routinely with groups uh, of innovators, and they identified a uh, airdroppable robot with sensors, and we knew to get the information to Natick Soldier Center, who then signed a cooperative agreement with that company to do additional testing. So that's just an example of, of a quick win. Gen General Murray also turned to me, I guess, about uh, six months ago and said, hey, I need to redesign my headquarters. I want to use the best practices out in industry in how people do information flow. And we assigned two of our folks, and they actually, no kidding, working directly for General Murray and General Richardson, helped them redesign the information flow and the structure of Army Futures Command. So the, those are just two examples, and, there, and there's more of them. But great question. Thank you. Who else has something for me? Sky's the limit. Who wants that prize? Nobody? All right. I always say I'm going to go till timer until there's an awkward silence. So, oh, well, well, one more. Well, there's another competitor then. All right. Um, so if I've got a new idea and I managed to get into contact with one of your um, officers that you mentioned earlier in, this, in the presentation, where along the way, if I have a new idea but not a specific application in mind, can they point out specifications I can sort of develop towards? Is that something they can provide input on or yeah, direct us great, to? Yeah, great question. So one of the things that we've been asked to do by a lot of colleges and universities is for us to go do seminars and practicums where we actually talk about Army requirements. Um, and I'm trying to think of the example. There, one of the things that, uh, how many folks have been involved with field, field artillery over the years? So are those shells like small, like shotgun shells, or really big and heavy? They're really big and heavy. I'm just going to give the answer to you. So that's, by and large, a manual process in some of our systems. So your rate of fire is directly related to how many, you know, how many shells those people can hoss from one side to the other. So we went off to industry, and they, they described the problem and at one of the colleges, and they were just looking blank faced said, well, we have no idea. And then one of the professors, who was actually a reserve guy, said, OK, what technology do we have where we could move about 75 pounds, three feet, and put it up in the air about 36 inches? You're like, oh, well, we can do that. So there's a lot of that. And, and we've been asked to do that. And we're glad to do that. If you're from a college or university, you'd like us to come and talk about Army problems, give some specific examples, and do that interactively, my folks are glad to do that as part of that ecosystem. And again, they'll be at those 23 locations throughout the United States. And, and I'm on the road, and my DCG are on the road all the time. So we're glad to come and do that for you. Great question. All right, have we reached the awkward science? I know, I know that we, we're not out of time, but we could, uh, I might give you back 10 minutes of your life you never thought you'd have. All right, 
Well, thank you very much on behalf of the soldiers of the uh, 75th and our civilians. And with that, you're going to... Are you going to prize? Well, we talked about music, right? We talked about that that's a creative effort. It's innovation because it's creativity with production. So here's an actual album produced by uh, a soldier in the, in the 75th. And so who's, who's going to win that prize? Who gave the, uh, the bet? All right, let's give her a big round of applause.